morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today's session of IPC Technologies uh, as part of our customer training webinar series. My name is Kurt Island. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Uh, these trainings are free to all our customers and are part of our continuing education in initiatives. Uh, as a reminder, we do record these sessions so you can review them later or encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can share some of the content, review it, or share it with any of your colleagues. Um, so you can learn to use that technology or um, um, uh, share it with uh, any of your other colleagues. Uh, just a reminder, our next training webinar will address work from home strategies on May 26th and best path to the cloud on June 9th. So those are some upcoming webinars we have. A quick review of the format. Today's session will last approximately 50 minutes, and we'll break the session into two parts. The first 20 minutes or so, we'll talk about SIP, and then the next 20 minutes, we'll cover the emerging technology of CPaaS, and we'll leave time at the end of each session for some Q&A. Um, if you do have questions, we encourage you to submit those in the, in the chat section and we'll try and get to everybody's um, questions um, at the end of each sec uh, segment. Uh, everybody is in listen-only mode, so that will be the only way to submit your questions. Uh, we'll try and wrap up within 50 minutes. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions, we'll follow up with you personally on email, and if um, you want to schedule any uh, follow-up meetings, uh, we'll be happy to do that as requested. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me switch here. So uh, I think we'd all agree that dial tone um, or how we make and receive calls has um, changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, even before the new normal from COVID-19 of working from home, the requirements for being able to make and receive calls from any device from any location seamlessly was really out there. Uh, SIP has been the underlying technology driving that change. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and some strategies for adopting SIP and why you might wanna consider SIP if you're not using it today. CPaaS, or Communications Platform as a Service, uh, is really the next evolution of SIP. And it's changing how businesses communicate internally and with their customers. I'm guessing most of you are maybe using one version of CPaaS, but we're really gonna explore on some case studies and more on how um, and why you might wanna consider CPaaS in your environment. Um, Intellipeer has been our trusted SIP partners for over five years now, and I'm super excited to introduce Kelly Davis and Pete Neal, who will be leading us on a deeper dive into SIP and CPaaS. Uh, both Kelly and Pete are industry veterans, like it or not, right, guys? <laughs> and Kelly is the director of channel sales at Intellipeer and has been there for over eight years. And Pete Neal is the senior sales engineer with seven years of experience at Intellipeer and is uh, coming to us from Greenville, South Carolina. So without any further ado, um, Kelly, Pete, uh, thanks again for joining us today. And I'll uh, hand it off to you to, to take over from here. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Kurt and IPC, for inviting us to your um, meeting today. We're excited to talk more about uh, Intellipeer and how we can um, give a little bit more information on SIP as well as our communication platform um, and what that means for uh, customers out there. Um, if you haven't explored communication as a platform. Um, hopefully we'll be able to give you some big ideas um, when you walk away uh, from the meeting today. So um, I always like to start out with um, a few little facts talking about the industry. We've all been affected over the last uh, six, eight weeks on everything that's happened with COVID. But prior to that, there was a lot of discussion out there in the industry for customers about how do we modernize communications and how do we make that um, journey for our company as well as the end users within our customers, uh, within our company as well as our customers and how is that impacting? And I just like to show some stats out there from some of the um, industry uh, 
folks, 451 Research, Gartner, they're always putting out information that we're all paying attention to. Um, but one thing you can see about it, they're talking about communications, they're talking about companies leveraging that, and what's going to be important for you as a company, as well as your customers, um, uh, whether it's adapting new types of uh, communications in addition to voice um, and SMS. And so I just wanted to put that out there um, in case that is some of the discussions you all have been having. But let me, um, let me talk through a little bit more about IntelliPeer, um, just to give you that groundwork if you're not familiar with us. IntelliPeer has been around for over 17 years. Uh, what we started out in the marketplace uh, has evolved over the last 17 years. But the mainstay is that we've been um, providing a service to our customers that usually is considered more of a next generation technology that becomes a mainstay for uh, our customers. We started out as the carrier's carrier providing SIP communications and gateways in the marketplace um, 2003. That was important for the folks like AT&T, Verizon, Level 3, so that they could try new technology from the legacy PRI or TDM services that they were using so that they could look forward and say, you know, what do we need to do next? How can we embody this into our uh, network? And it was a great uh, partnership that we had. What we learned um, is that we wanted to take that to the next step. And so in about 2010, we began working with enterprise communications uh, and we focused solely on enterprises and that meant the customers out there, anywhere from eight uh, users up to thousands of users. We were helping them make that journey from PRI or TDM to voice over IP using SIP trunking. And so as um, time has gone by in the last few years, we've noted that communications um, is kind of re-engineering or adding to what it is. Just um, It's not just voice. If you um, day to day, you probably find that you're incorporating more communication channels into your day to day work as well as personal um, with SMS uh, as well as other forms of communication. Um, so we decided three years ago to add SMS into our platform so that not only could we offer our SIP trunking, but any of our customers could also use SMS um, with the numbers that we provided on the network. So that worked really well for the thousands of customers that we had if they wish to add SMS into their communications. Um, and so what we then decided was, you know what, let's make this a little bit more um, robust um, and build out more capabilities for our customers to interact. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about our communications platform in a bit, but I just wanted to highlight that that it has been a 17 year progression that we have continued to provide that technology and communications to our customers so that they can have the right tools so that they can manage their business and they can drive revenue, they can have more efficiencies um, and reduce costs. And, and the bottom line is everybody wants to in, improve that communication out there, but as well as the customer experience and the employee experience that they provide. We're enterprise focused to this day um, since 2010, and we have millions of customers out there using us. And the company continues to grow year over year, um, and projections continue to show us um, very strong company. Just so you know, we are certified. Um, when we decided to make that choice to move away from the different carriers, we wanted to focus on the enterprise customers, but we knew it was important to have certain certifications and validations out there so that we could work with all the different manufacturers out there. So we've done the due diligence to certify with um, all of these and uh, different manufacturers, and we continue to update that as um, the market matures. As you can see from the customers that we have, these are only a few that reflect um, who we're working with, but we really are agnostic to the verticals um, that are out there because our goal is to help enable customers to move forward with their communication plans um, 
so that they can hit those uh, milestones that they need to, whether it's centralizing their overall communication strategy uh, as well as reducing costs. But we do have a very referenceable base and our customers are always willing to uh, speak with future customers at any time. So what we've been known for over the years, I mentioned before we started out as a carrier's ca carrier providing SIP, but we've always been known, yes, we can provide just easy inbound, outbound, your DIDs, your toll-free numbers, uh, international calling, um, everything that you would um, assimilate with your PRI service, um, and that is exactly what SIP can do as well. But what we've also noticed is that more people are using their smartphones in running business, in um, interacting with their customers, uh, and so we have made it a, a huge part of our business to make sure that that is included um, as a mechanism uh, and communication for our customers as well. So we do have the ability to provide what are called um, regular uh, um, DIDs or toll-free numbers to be used for SMS, just enabling your current DIDs or toll-free toll numbers. But we also can support what are called short codes. And many of you have probably seen those out there um, around the holidays when folks are trying to hire. You might see somebody say text careers or hiring to um, a five-digit number. And th that's called a short code. And those are becoming very popular. In fact, they probably will be taking over um, what used to be the popular toll-free numbers uh, and having your own vanity 1-800-Flowers type of number. Um, they're becoming just as popular um, and taking on that vanity. We also provide network connectivity to our customers. So probably 98% of our customers um, go over the top with us. Um, and then we do we try to stay bandwidth agnostic. We'll work with our customers on the design based on how many concurrent call paths they need to the uh, internet that they have and make sure that it is robust and ready to go um, to support the traffic. But there are customers we know need a dedicated connection between us and their um, connection uh, and their um, locations, and we can support that as well. So we can be very uh, pivotal in, in providing that connection that is needed um, to support the business that, that you have. Um, and within the design of a solution, we will take all of those um, considerations in as we build out the solution for you. And then we also have our communication platform. It's a cloud-based capabilities where um, we can offer um, a toolkit for our customers to go in and re-engineer the communication interactions. Um, so taking maybe some manual processes that you have today for sending out reminders or um, getting information that it's repetitive information that your teams are being asked. And maybe if it was as easy just to put it on a SMS out to customers um, to make it easier for them to get that information. But we're gonna, we are gonna highlight that in the latter part of our presentation to show you how easy it is um, to design and build and launch a communications um, quickly. Pete, you wanna talk about our network? Sure, thank you, Kelly. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Pete Neal, and one small change to Kurt's uh, intro, I am now out of Beaufort, South Carolina. I live on the coast. I appreciate all your all's time today. Um, before we get into the network and all, I, I just wanted to give you a little sip sort of 101, if you don't mind. SIP stands for Session Initiation Protocol. And what it is, it's really a series of two events that allow, in effect, connectionless support for voice services across public internet. Uh, if you look at the old hierarchy where you had POTS lines or PRIs, these were nailed up facilities between a customer premise and a local central office. And the only thing those services could pretty much be used for was voice. If they were idle, the carrying capacity, the bandwidth in effect that those circuits supplied was useless. SIP basically allows you now to utilize existing resources like public IP 
as a way to make more efficient use of that broadband's capability so that you don't need two separate connections to run your voice and your data anymore. You can do both over a blended connection over public internet. And that's where a lot of the strength comes in. There are huge operational cost savings, and there are definitely things that you can do from what we, the term we use is disaster avoidance, from a, a disaster avoidance planning strategy that SIP gives you because it's connectionless that uh, local PRI and POTS type services never could. When you look at IntelliPeer historically, I think we did three things right when we left the wholesale space. The first thing, we kept the topology that kept Quest and Verizon and AT&T happy. A little over 30 separate SIP gateways deployed in Telex facilities in Chicago and Dallas and out in a company, a data center called Zeo in Centennial, Colorado. We have a primary network operations center, 24 by 7, 365 in Denver. We have a backup in Boca Raton, Florida. Everything's linked together with 10 gig optical waves in, in a um, break-free kind of sonnet technology where things will automatically reroute should there be any kind of service interruption between data centers. The other thing we did, the second thing we did, we kept most of the human beings. Uh, when you look at the various organizational pieces of, of a company like IntelliPeer, number admin, provisioning, uh, network operations, you know, all of the back office and, and, and even the, the, the people who interface with customers. Um, most of us have done it at the carrier level. We've done it at the enterprise level for a long time. So we, we understand how to take a look at things and how to design things. The third thing, and I think this is just as important, um, we're not trying to be all things to all people. We don't sell internet. We don't sell MPLS. We don't sell gear. We focus on SIP trunking, and now the platform is a service technology that's taking that connectionless capability and giving customers authority over building their own communications destiny. We think that it's, it's interesting, you know, you hear a lot in, from people in our field that SIP is a commodity anymore, and you should just buy it on price. We take a little bit different view. We say it's, it's a commodity until it breaks. When you can't talk to the world and the world can't talk to you, all of a sudden something isn't a commodity anymore. So where I think we really stand out, and, and I've been doing this a long time at, at five different um, companies through buyouts, is that disaster avoidance approach that we take to design. And whether you're talking to IntelliPeer or anyone else, um, there are three areas that you need to have discussions internally and with your prospective SIP provider to make sure that you guys can have a disaster avoidant network. The reason we use the term a disaster avoidance, it's proactive. Everywhere else I've ever worked in my life, when you talked about design with a customer, it was disaster recovery. It was reactive, something broke, what do we do? At IntelliPeer, we know how this stuff works and we know where it breaks. And when you know where something breaks, that means that you can plan ahead of time so that some, should something break, it doesn't necessarily take your customer out of service. And one fact that I think is really important, you know, we have five nines, as you can see on this slide, for uptime. That's pretty strong. Um, most of the players in the industry have a lot of nines in their SLAs. The way I look at it, if you got a nine in your SLA, it means something broke, right? So. Now we're looking at the reality. Things break on the customer side, things break on the carrier side. So plan for it in advance. When we talk to customers, we look in, we look at three areas. The first, how do we protect you against us, All right, Because we've got parts, parts break. One of the things that SIP really does, because it's connectionless, it does not require dedicated facilities out of the nearest central office is it lets you spread the risk. A normal topology between us and an IPC customer has a primary SIP trunking relationship from our nearest data center to the customer. It's backed up by a mirror image redundant somewhere else. So let's say we've got a customer up in Virginia. I'm gonna build a primary trunk group that they can connect to over public IP out of my Chicago data center. 
I'm going to build that mirror image down in Dallas. What that allows me to do is if I lose the hardware in Chicago that's providing you that gateway, my backup in Dallas dynamically takes over and keeps you talking to the outside world while directing calls from the world to you. That's a pretty strong capability and we can mix and match it depending on how a customer's actual uh, deployments look. The other two places where things can break are on your side and they don't get a lot of attention from the, the carriers, the network service providers out there. I'm sure that you've all heard that dreaded no trouble found at one point in your life. That means the carrier looked at its stuff, it's good, it says, well, Mr. Customer, I'm happy. You know, good luck fixing your issue. We take a different approach. Um, the first of the two areas on a customer side where things can go haywire is on the access side. You know, just like a dedicated PRI, if somebody with a backhoe cuts a circuit, you know, you're out. Because public internet now has become so effective and so economically advantageous, People are being able to buy what used to be carrier grade backbone type speeds and circuits for really smart money. Um, you know, it's not the burden that it used to be. So we're seeing more and more customers move into what we call a, a two ISP strategy, where they may have a primary circuit for their voice and data from a tier one, like an AT&T, a Quest, um, excuse me, a CenturyLink or a Verizon. And they'll have a backup from a strong regional provider. What IntelliPeer can do, when we know that a customer has multiple access methodologies, is orient our trunk groups so that should your primary internet go down, we can automatically send traffic to that backup internet circuit. So that even though all our stuff is good, if we notice we can't reach you via Internet Circuit 1, we'll flow the traffic to Internet Circuit 2. When we see number one come back, then we'll restore. The other thing, and, and this is really important, and it's on a per customer basis, because everybody does things differently, you guys have parts of your own, right? Um, my Telgear, we've worked with them for a long time. For about three and a half years, we were the uh, SIP provider to, for all their um, POC, or proof of concept demo kits across the US and most in Canada. Mitel gear works really well, but it doesn't like lightning. It doesn't like power brownouts. So once we understand how a customer has their end of the, the hardware deployed, and the, most times we may see like the primary instance in a data center with a backup at headquarters, we can take those primary and redundant trunks that we would provide and split them up so that should you lose a site, we can dynamically flow traffic to another location. So to, to wrap that all up, it, it's really about understanding that there are three primary areas where things can break. And whomever you're talking to, make sure that that person understands those areas and can, can bring a design that can let something break without taking you all out of service. Um, next, please, Kelly. Thanks. So here's just a, a little kind of an example of a disaster avoidant um, topology. In this case, you've got HA or highly available deployment at the customer side with a primary MBG. You know, Mitel uses a device called the Mitel Border Gateway to handle its SIP traffic. So you've got a primary and a backup Mitel Border Gateway. You have two totally separate internet circuits. And one of the keys here, uh, we found this a couple of years ago when level three took a dump for a long time or went down. Um, if you're going to go with a primary being a tier one and a backup being a regional, make sure that the regional provider doesn't rely on that primary that you're using for its long haul stuff. All right, because if, if the primary goes down and your backup also uses them, um, all of a sudden your backup's not gonna work either. So in this case, you're seeing a primary trunk out of IntelliPeer Data Center 1 taking the favored path to reach the customer via their primary internet and their primary hardware. And then we have that dynamic capability to flow traffic to that customer backup internet and customer backup gateway if, if one's in touch. 
So there's a lot of different ways to put a good disaster avoidant plan in that lets something break without taking you out of service. Um, Kelly? Okay. And this is a real good one too, because there is a huge difference technically in the way SIP operates and also in the way it supports 911. You know, if you look at the old model, because you were hardwired to a local, what they call a central office, your phone numbers were handcuffed. You couldn't pick them up like I used to live in Greenville, about 300 miles from here. You couldn't pick up a Greenville number and move it to Beaufort, right, where, where I live today. SIP, numbers become virtual. You know, if you talk to any engineers, if there's any engineers on the call, we all hate the term virtual, but in SIP, numbers become virtual. Once you port them to a SIP provider, they break the handcuffs of that old geographic rate center, and they can be deployed anywhere in the country. So you could take a Los Angeles originated number, and you could bring it down to Beaufort, South Carolina, 3,000 miles away in SIP, and it'll work all day long. So the question then becomes, how do I support 911? Well, the first thing to understand, IntelliPeer provides services in all 50 states and in about 40% of Canada. We are compliant with all legal and regulatory agencies for the provisioning and handling of 911 services in the United States and in Canada as well, to include some of the new laws that are coming in, on board, uh, Kaylee's law and, and one other that'll be in, in, in effect with uh, 2021. The way we support 911 is by allowing customers to assign a physical place of use in our customer portal to every DID that they have, and they can be the same or they can be different. When we see a call to 911, we don't care where it comes from. You know, it could come into us from maybe a, a head end deployment in Atlanta, but the, the 911 number has a physical place of use in Beaufort. We take a look at the originating number in the from field towards that call. We match it up to the physical place of use that the customer has assigned, and it's controllable by the customer via the portal we then route to the correct public safety answering position. One of the things that we've also expanded our capability on is, is adding what you might call granular detail to that 911 address. Um, not only could you put in there that it's 123 Main Street, Beaufort, but let's say it's a multi-story building and you wanna get granular in, in how that coverage is actually supported. You can go into our portal and you could put 123 Main Street, Beaufort, South Carolina, first floor, room 203, whatever you want. Um, one of our customers is a fitness, a, a national fitness provider. They have gyms all over the US. They use two DIDs per store for 911 purposes. They both have the same street address. One says front desk, the other says weight room. So th there's a lot of different ways that you can set up 911 even in a what they call a, a, a UCAS or a unified environment where your MITEL may sit at your headquarters or in a data center and all of your other sites are behind it as remotes, you can still safely ensure and provision 911 services for all of your users. Next, please, Kelly. Another thing, too, I'm not sure if many of you on the call are big, what we would call toll free users. Um, I personally have been a fan of toll-free numbers for about 20-some years. Because if you think about it, the two most things, important things that a business can do, gain revenue and retain revenue, toll-free numbers support that, either because they're supporting sales lines or customer service lines. They actually provide a fourth area where things can break, and that's on what's termed the originating access side meaning if Pete and Buford picks up his phone and dials an 800 number that's gonna to terminate to IPC in Virginia, that call has to get from Buford to IPC's provider. If the link between that provider and the outside world is down on the front end of the call, nothing that that provider has in place between itself and IPC matters 
because they can't get the call to deliver in the first place. IntelliPeer has relationships with three national toll-free originating providers for the U.S. and Canada. We are a RESPORG, which means that we have the ability to go in and administer toll-free routing in the National 800 database for our customers. At present, we have a little over 600,000 toll-free numbers that we take care of for our existing customers. Every one of them, we use a strategy called dual loading, where we'll take two of those three providers and we'll have them set routes in place so that should their network see a call come to them towards that toll free, they'll deliver it to IntelliPeer. That means if one of my providers has an issue, I can go into the National 800 database and dynamically change how the world routes those calls, bringing them to myself over a separate link from a totally different provider so it allows me to restore my customers' toll-free traffic um, significantly faster than any other network service provider who only has one way to get that traffic to them. Uh, again, it works really well. Uh, the last time it was tested is going on three years ago now. Um, quick snapshot there, a, a large regional provider in the Northeast was down for eight hours. We had one customer who had toll frees with that provider and others with us. We had them restored in about 40 minutes. The numbers that were not with us but were with that provider were down for eight hours. So if, you, if you're heavily dependent on toll free, we even extend disaster avoidance kind of strategies into that front end, you know, getting the call from the world environment. Kelly? Absolutely, thanks Pete. At this point, we want to see if there were any questions so far. Um, Kurt, can you see any questions from our audience? Um, yeah, there were a couple came in. I think Pete addressed one of them, um, and it had to do with ability to port numbers and reallocate them to different parts. But the other part of that question was the process of switching in terms of how long it takes to switch from PRIs to SIP. Uh, can you address that? Sure, be happy to. Yeah, and that's a multi, it's a multi-layered question. Um, the first thing you have to do is determine how are you going to enable your existing system to be able to take uh, SIP traffic. Um, like if you have a PRI, you don't necessarily need that MyTel border gateway. So the first thing you do is you talk to IPC, what do I need to do to get the SIP licenses to support that traffic? And do I need to add any additional hardware or software? Once you're in place and ready to go with SIP, it takes IntelliPeer about 10 days to get trunks built for a new customer. And again, the key here is this is a connectionless environment. I don't install anything at your premise like a PRI does. What will happen is, is you'll give me information so that I can reach that MyTel border gateway across the public internet authenticate myself to it, and then send signaling that basically sets calls up and down. That takes us about 10 days. We then provide test numbers, uh, non-production numbers, to IPC so that they can work with us on what's called an interop, where IPC techs will call in to IntelliPeer, we'll have a bridge conference, we'll make calls of a, of a wide variety of ranges so that we're happy that it works and that IPC is happy that it works on your behalf. Once that environment is up, that circuit is ready and in a production model. It can be used for outbound traffic as soon as that testing is done. But the process to move numbers from your existing carrier to IntelliPeer, that's called a DID or local number port. Depending on the amount of numbers you have, and, the, and who the existing carrier is, that process can take anywhere from two weeks to 45 days. Um, we've been doing it, like Kelly said, we've been working with number admin groups and porting thousands and thousands of numbers at the carrier space uh, for a long time now. So we've got a pretty good idea if you say, well, we're using XYZ and we're trying to bring 500 numbers over, we can set expectations on how long that process will probably take. The beauty is, is that when we submit for a port, we're gonna ask for a specific date. 
the losing carrier will come back and either honor that date or give us a date that it believes it can be ready on. When that happens, it will not be done in the dark without an IPC or IntelliPeer customer knowing what's going on. Uh, we get what's called FOC or firm order confirmation. We pass that on to the folks at IPC. They work with the customer, get everybody ready. The numbers swing, and then you can turn down the PRIs. But we're really big fans of not trying to turn something off at the same time that you're turning it on. So running in parallel protects you as a business, as an enterprise, by always having a fallback methodology and making sure that everything's working fine before you disconnect existing services. Uh, a little bit of a long answer, but uh, Kurt, do you think that was sufficient? Yeah, I think so. Um, and then one other one, it's, it wasn't a question, but more of an observation of working through a lot of these conversions uh, with IntelliPeer over the years. And if you could just provide a little bit of commentary on the discrepancy between taxes and fees that we're seeing carriers pass through on PRI related circuits upwards of 20, sometimes 30% of the recurring charges and how IntelliPeer compares and, and why you're exempt from some of those fees. Sure. Yeah, that's, you want to get that, Kelly? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, um, IntelliPeer is considered uh, within the regulatory um, realm as a voice over IP provider, SIP, SIP trunking. And so because of that, there are different regulatory taxes um, that we are not required to uh, charge our customers because we are not looked at in the PRI or traditional TDM regulatory uh, means. So with that being said, IntelliPeer charges state and local taxes um, to our customers based on where the SIP resides. So it's pretty easy and, um, and very much different than what the, they may have seen, a customer may have seen with their traditional carrier. Yeah, and to Kelly's point, um, consider it a window of opportunity. Uh, we charge like federal excise tax, but the, the USF charges a, a lot of the regulatory fees that were be able to crammed in on the old legacy providers. The taxing authorities haven't caught up to it yet, okay? So it doesn't mean that it's going to be evergreen and that they're not going to figure out that, hey, the whole world's going IP. We need to start recovering revenue. But for right now, uh, we are seeing people saving anywhere from 15 to 20 percent just on the taxes alone. Yep. Yep. Great. Well, let's keep moving along. We've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left to jump into the platform as a service. Um, sure. So let's uh, jump into that and we'll do some more Q&As at the end of that session. Great. So this, um, I want to talk through a few of these um, because it may be something that happened pre-COVID, um, but what we're finding is some of the goals that a customer may have had for, uh, or challenges that they were having and goals that they were trying to achieve um, via communications have all of a sudden um, rapidly uh, become the point of concern for a customer. Um, we, right when COVID happened, uh, we took a step back and each one of us, Pete, myself, everybody in the company, we just started calling our customers and asking them, where can we help? What can we do? What are the major concerns? So these six points um, are really what we learned from our customers and how um, our communication platform has been a great segue for our customers that were traditional SIP customers with us at the time. And now we're helping them achieve um, and these different points that, and challenges that they were having. So everything from, yes, many, if not all of us have had to go to remote status and how do we um, support our employees? How do we support our customers? Um, how do you build out a continue, um, continuation plan so that um, you can have um, the continued operational uh, plans going? Uh, what we've seen for some state organizations, they can't keep up with the number of calls coming in, whether it's for unemployment or other things that um, 
they need their citizens need to get information on. Um, as well, that's happening with other companies. Um, so there's a loss in productivity for their employees, but they also, because they've gone remote, how do we get that information out to our employees readily? Is it just email? Um, because what stats show is that there's a 45% um, response rate when you send out a text um, and those texts are or opened 90% of the time within three minutes. But with email, it's only 25%. So if you've got to get information out quickly to your employees, hey, we have to shut down this location or we're going to open up now, how's the best way to do that? And again, many of you may be um, compounded right now with the high volume of calls um, and everything's changing. So what we're going to do is walk through um, how our looking at changing communications or even adding new channels to your organization and to how you communicate internally and externally will help drive new revenue because of new engagements. You can decrease costs that way. And a lot of folks are having to look at how do we shave off um, costs on our budget and do things more effectively. But overall, you're, it's an increase of um, customer satisfaction as well as employee satisfaction. Pete, you wanna walk through our platform? Sure. Um, so the landscape really has changed, folks, and it's not going to go back. So it's in, it's really important that everybody take a look at what's out there today. Um, we've been working with this stuff for about a year and a half now, and a lot of companies that we've talked to in the last year were like, "Oh, this is really cool," but you know, we're we're busy. Now all of a sudden, it's people are having a different discussion. Not only are they trying to figure out how to handle the, the challenges that we've seen the last two months, but what do they do going forward? So IntelliPeer has a suite of services that are very capable, uh, not only of helping in the current environment, but helping to future-proof how communication is changing and how businesses are gonna change to do it. Uh, we have voice and messaging where we can enable SMS on a one-to-one -one kind of relationship for businesses. Uh, we have a tool called Engage. That is a perfect way to do the, what's known in our side as the one-to-many, meaning one person creates a campaign to send it to you know, hundreds or thousands of recipients on the far end. Smart flows, that's the heavy hitter of our platform as a service suite. It's where you can go in and actually build your own communications flows, be they inbound, be they outbound, um, a, a, it's a toolkit and it's, it's worth taking a look at because there are strategies like call deflection and automation that businesses are increasingly seeing not only as a way to handle the requirements of this little period we're in, but as a better way to orchestrate handling things in the future as well. You know, all the great stuff, um, if you can't get any kind of stats on it or reporting, then it's not really doing its, its full job for you. So we have an analytical program called Insights. It's available straight through the same portal that people handle their SIP trunking with us today. It allows you to take a look at granular detail on CDRs, voice call records, on MDRs, SMS records, and then the new term ADR or application detail records, when you may build a flow that gives people nine or 10 choices in that customer experience, and you wanna see how many times the people pick number one, how many times did they pick number two. Um, all of the things that businesses are now using to automate and improve the way they communicate to their customers and internally, you can gain access to that information so you can sharpen your plans. And then integrations. Um, this is a, a really interesting one. People will ask us a lot of times, does SmartFlows integrate with X? And it's always a great opportunity for me to say, that's really the wrong question. The, the better question is, can I communicate or talk to my database using your platform as a service? Because I may want to have my customers be able to call in, enter a nine digit order number, and automatically get status of their of their order when it's going to ship and have it texted back to them or have it read to them text to speech. So there's three requirements that, in, that are in place to have databases talk to each other. They have to be reachable from the outside world. 
meaning there has to be a URL that my smart flows can, can input to know how to get to it. They have to provide some kind of way to authenticate me to them, to let them know that I have access to look at their records and to make changes to them. And there's about three or four different ways that databases can provide that authentication key that we can use. And then the third is the, what I called a content type. Um, there's a, a ton of different coding out there. We use what are called open APIs. IntelliPeer Smart Flows and Engage are built on REST Open API, which is probably the most popular kind of database to database interface out there. And it uses a content type called JSON, J S O N. So if your database can be reached, if it can be authenticated to, and if it can talk JSON, then we can do the four things that allow databases to talk to each other. We can do a GET. GET, where we go in and we look for a particular record and we pull specific information out of that record. We can do a post where we can take caller information and insert it as a totally brand new record inside a database. We can also do what are called patches and puts, where we're changing a field inside an existing record in a database. I'm sure you all have heard a lot and you see it on your phones where when you're getting unsolicited or, or unrequested SMSs, it's called opt-in or opt-out. Um, and that's a whole other discussion on you know, how you're handling SMS. But if you're sending something out for a marketing purpose, you have to give the, the recipient the right to opt-out. If that recipient sends back to you like quit or whatever phrase you use to opt-out, that database interconnectivity will allow smart flows to take the, the phone number that called or that responded, the fact that that person has chosen to opt out, and to write that information into your database so that the next time you do a marketing run or a communications flow of some sort, you don't contact that person and you stay within the agreed regulations. So integrations is key. We are There's nothing proprietary on our side. There are very few databases that we cannot interface with to do that get, the post, the patch, or the put. Um, Kelly, next, please. Fast and easy to deploy. The biggest advantage in my mind of platform as a service, outside of the fact that now it can be omni-channel, meaning you can do SMS, you can do voice, you can mix and match those in the same customer interaction. It used to be that if you wanted to have something done for a contact center or any kind of automation, you had to submit a statement of work to the carrier and you hope they got it right, hope they did it timely. Platform as a service moves the authority and the capability from the provider like IntelliPeer to the end user. You don't even have to talk to IntelliPeer to do these once that you're set up for this. If any of y'all have ever used Microsoft Visio before, we use the term drag and drop. It's a visual designer tool where you combine triggers and actions and you use your mouse. The flow that you're seeing in the middle of this screen was built by someone taking a mouse and choosing the different elements in this toolkit that they need to put together to solve a particular business challenge. When you're done with the build, you hit save, deploy, it works. Um, it, very, very strong. It moves the power of control over your own destiny to the enterprise. Next, please, Kelly. I think it's on you. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Sorry about that. So I want to give you some live examples so that um, you can understand how some of our customers, based on some of those points that we talked about in the beginning of, of they were they needed to change communications, they needed to adapt and modernize, um, and what was the concerns that they had going on at their organization? I, I think seeing some uh, real use cases in the works helps you to visualize how this might be appropriate for your company. So this public utility, uh, one of our customers has a toll-free number that goes to their contact center with about a thousand agents. And the concern was if they have something like a water main break or anything that impacts an event, as they call it, um, it totally shuts down their contact center because the sheer volume 
Um, there are not enough agents. There's not capacity in their, um, in their PBX and uh, contact center, and they, they just cannot in any way be proactive because they don't know if a water main is going to break or something should occur. So it's kind of a double whammy, and because their customers are getting upset because of the long wait times, um, agents are up set and they're getting fatigued because of the long hours that they're trying to take care of um, these customers. So it can be expensive as well. But what we did is we helped them so that we built out what we called the ability to triage those extra calls that went above a thousand. And so when that thousand and one call came in, then we were able to build um, a self-service front end so that it deflected the call away from the agent provided some information. We know that there was a main break on XYZ Street. We expect to have it create uh, fixed in about four hours, um, or it could um, give them the ability that they could be text um, some information to keep them up to date uh, on how things were going. So by helping them deflect that information, providing other avenues of communication, this really helped them um, in eliminating the number of calls that were then coming into that toll-free number, coming into those thousand agents, um, and no longer were they having those crazy surges. And then over um, a little bit of time um, beyond that, when they got out of that craziness, um, what they're now doing is when Pete mentioned about our Engage campaign, they're now proactively contacting customers uh, via SMS, hey, we're going to be testing the water. Please know that that's happening uh, May 1st through May 10th. Um, so that proactiveness um, has really helped so that they're not getting those questions at um, their toll-free um, and contact center. Another one of our customers, um, they're a financial organization, um, and they needed to reduce the talk time uh, for their agents um, when the customers were calling in just to ask about card activations. All they, we've all got them. You get a number um, to call and activate the card. Well, physical folks were taking those calls and activating it. So what we help them do is that, that when they called in, the um, person calling in was now able to activate that card right on the phone. And seems simple enough, but it reduced the number of calls coming in to the agents so that they could then concentrate on more activities that needed an agent to walk through and the card activations could get done faster um, and at any time of the day. So again, helping with that um, the inbound volume that was coming in, but also creating that self-service for um, the customer. And then what they've also done is they've also been able to reduce the labor cost of the agents because creating that self-service on some of those common activities it allowed them to reduce their headcount, which they needed to do to save costs. Um, so that's another example of how um, a customer was uh, able to use our CPAS. Another one uh, is um, secure transportation. They're, they are considered the Uber of medical transportation. Um, they service insurance companies, education, and even executives um, will contact them. And at the time, at the beginning, they've they have been using, again, a toll-free number for somebody to call in and schedule um, their ride. And they had been using um, some other SMS providers out there um, with Twilio and Amazon, but they were having network um, outages and it was affecting the service to their clients. So um, what we did was work with them to make a more self-service um, capability for folks to call in um, and instead of getting a live agent, they could schedule their um, driver uh, and based on you know, when they needed it and um, not have to wait on a live agent to answer the call. So um, prior to that, um, because they had been losing with their prior carriers um, messages and the ability to, to schedule, they were, but they were also, um, not only the customer satisfaction was down, but also revenue. So they were able to now automate um, these repetitive tasks um, of scheduling, and then they could then start being more proactive to confirm the appointments um, with uh, the registration that 
the person had made by calling in, and then the system um, and CPAS um, were able to send out an outbound message saying, don't forget, Don, you have your uh, appointment at um, May 11th at 3 p.m. Confirm C or uh, decline D, let's say. So they were able to um, build that out. And then it also, uh, because we were able to resolve those outages that they were previously having, they were able to deliver faster communications out to um, their uh, customers. So it, it was a win-win for um, this transportation company. And now they're looking at other proactive ways that they can communicate both employee-wise um, as well as uh, to their customers. And the last one I wanted to highlight was the longtime IntelliPure customer. They've been a direct response company and they have only advertised on TV. So those as seen on TV commercials. Big thing that was happening with them was that they had customers calling in to order their product but then they would abandon the call because they had a long wait time. And so they were losing um, that response uh, with the customers. And they decided that, you know, what are some ways that we can get back that business that we've lost? And how can we also maybe appeal to a younger crowd? We've always had a demographic that was in a certain age group, but we really think we can go to a different demographic. So um, they, they were losing a lot of sales, the call abandonment, and then the agents were getting frustrated because they couldn't respond quickly. So we worked with them to create um, a callback campaign. We looked at when Pete was talking about the CDRs, the call detail records, and looking at the analytics, we were able to look at the abandoned calls that they have and built a campaign that we um, sent text messages out to those abandoned callers and they were able to offer them a coupon for so sorry we missed your call we'd love to have your business here's a 20 percent coupon for your next order and what it did is it took a um they were able to re-engage customers and there that increased from 10 percent up to 40 percent and it was huge revenues for them um, in getting that re-engagement so that just shows you some different ways that customers have adapted and modernized their communication um, to fit the business and what it may have been again eight weeks ago um, or what they need readily today the beauty of our platform is it's all cloud-based and at your fingertips so a customer can easily go into the portal and design build and launch a communication plan that fits today and fits tomorrow or fits next week. So with that, if you have your phones handy, I would love if you could go ahead and um, pull it out. And uh, if you can text my initials, KD to 27227. And you'll receive my business card. So here's an example of a way to take static information, the business cards that we hand out, uh, and now we've made it digital. And we've actually purposely taken many of the tools that you would find on our website, and we've put it into a short code, 27227, and built a library of static information that now can be get driven out to customers um, at any time and at your convenience. I wanna thank you for joining us for this call. Um, we'll hand it over to Kurt in a second um, so that we can see if there's any questions. Um, we are here to answer for sure, but just for something fun, and just another way um, that you can use our software is we have built a survey out to our customers just something fun a while back to connect with them. And if you text HERO to 303-223-2108, you'll be able to see how the interaction back and forth could be adopted into your organization. But this was some way that we did some questions back and forth to the customer via text and created a great communication change the questions, 
change the, um, the need, and you could adopt that for your customers um, and employees as well. Kurt? Great, thanks Kelly. Uh, there was one question, we're right up against the, the hour, but the question really was, do I need to use IntelliPeer SIP to use the Atmosphere platform? And I think the answer is no on that. So you can use some of these technologies, even if you have another SIP uh, or other voice platform, they, they, they operate independently. Correct. Um, so that will wrap up our session today. Uh, I really appreciate um, Pete and Kelly and IntelliPeer for, for joining and sharing some of those uh, case studies specifically on the Atmosphere platform and how to use that. If any of this uh, warrants additional discovery, I encourage you to reach out to us and we can uh, talk further about how this technology can solve real business problems across any segment within your organization. And I do also want to remind you that coming up on May 26th is our next session on uh, working from home strategies and on June 9th, uh, best path to the cloud. So thanks again, everybody, for joining, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.